to do social distancing over this next hour that we are going to be worshiping together. Um, there's going to be a lot going on here. Like one thing I can guarantee you, a couple things I can guarantee you. First, that we are going to mess up today. There are going to be glitches. So you'll have to bear with us, but we're going to we're going to, we're going to fix them as quickly as possible to keep things moving also. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to praise God with joyous hearts. So uh, once again, welcome. Uh, we are going to be uh, uh, rotating as quickly as possible, cutting down on dead air, using different mics whenever possible. So uh, sit back, wherever you may be, however you may be watching, uh, welcome. Good morning. morning. And today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're so grateful to Ev for all that he has done to help put uh, this joint effort together. I also want to say a special word of thanks to all the tech people who have all had to figure out all kinds of new technology uh, to make this live broadcast available throughout our community and throughout even our world and musicians and folks from all of these congregations who uh, have come together to each offer, offer their gift in this joint work of ministry. We've always known that we are the body of Christ and that the divisions between our congregations are uh, temporary and uh, they are illusory, that we are one body of Christ. And now we are experiencing that and uh, in a very real and a beautiful way. I also want to remind everyone that even as we can't physically be together, all of our congregations continue need to need a financial support. And so uh, our church and Chipley and others have ways to give online. And you can go on our websites and click the donate button to continue to uh, support the church financially. You can uh, mail your gift into your church. You can bring it by your church. But we want to make sure that we continue to do the work of ministry, even as we're not able to be physically present. Also remember, too, that the work of the church does not end when we're not together physically in worship on Sunday morning. And the work of the church really is to be the body of Christ and to care one another and to um, reach out in concern and service to our neighbors. And so make sure this week that you take some time uh, to make a phone call, to send a card, to send a text message, to use whatever form of communication you can to reach out to brothers and sisters in your congregation, uh, also in your circle of influence. Right now we are acutely aware of the need of our grace, uh, the, the grace of our God, and that grace is available to us. And so let's offer it to one another. And uh, Josh, will you come and open our time together in prayer? All right, let us pray. God, we, uh, we know that you're in the midst of us, no matter where we're at, whether we're on the couch, whether we're laying in bed, whether we're sitting in here as the pastors are gathered to support, and I pray that you would just uh, be with us during this time and remind us, as it says in Deuteronomy 31 8, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And God, during this time of uncertainty, I know there's a lot of fear, and I pray that we would. Stand on that promise that we should not be fear and have no dismay because your fear does not stand a chance when we stand in your love, God. And I pray we would remember to look after the needs of those who may need it during this time. And as uh, Nathan said, Lord, just be on the lookout for people that you may be able to serve during this time because we may not be in a church building this morning, but we are still the church ourselves. So we and take your love to others where they need it and serve them as they need. And I pray we would have a great worship service this morning and continue to put you first in our lives each moment of every day. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Now, you should receive probably in your, uh, whatever way you were contacted to be online, there is a bulletin there too, and we'll sing a hymn that everybody knows. And uh, so, as we, uh, I'll give you a little a time to find it. it. Probably it's in your web browser somewhere in there. So it's great, ain't that faithful? It's just a song, a hymn that we all know. So I'm going to invite the ones that are here to stand and sing. 
but if you, uh, if you will, you just uh, sing along with us.
Let us open the Word of God together and look in the book of John. Looking at chapter 9, it says this. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, to wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging and asked, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he insisted, himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Jumping down to verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Giving glory to God by telling the truth, they said, We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have already told you. You do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. There was a blind girl who hated herself because she was blind. She hated everyone. Everyone except her loving boyfriend. He was always there for her. She told her boyfriend, if only I could see the world, I would marry you. One day, someone donated a pair of eyes to her. When the bandages came off, she was able to see everything, including her boyfriend. He asked her, now that you can see the world, Will you marry me? The girl looked at her boyfriend and saw that he was blind. The sight of his closed eyes shocked her. She hadn't expected that. The thought of looking at them for the rest of her life left her to refuse to marry him. Her boyfriend left devastated and in tears. Days later, he wrote a note to her saying, Take good care of your eyes, my dear. For before they were yours, they were mine. The Bible says you and I were dead to our sins, that all have fallen short of the glory of God. We were all blind to the truth of God's redeeming grace. But one day Jesus stepped out of heaven, and he not only gave us the faith necessary for salvation, he gave his whole life for us. He gave it all so that you and I could be transformed into his very likeness. That's the glory of the gospel. The irony in John's story is that the blind man receives sight, but everyone else in the story loses theirs. Not their physical vision, but their capacity to believe and understand what they have witnessed. Without exception, neighbors, Pharisees, and the parents are unable to see the event that God does provide. Not even the man who has been healed understands what happened to him. It's only after Jesus seeks him out and calls him to the faith of the Son of Man that he truly sees. In this story, we see Christ comes to transform us. And like the donor in the story I told, it's the eyes that we should take care of because the new eye transform more than the world that we see. But if we use them as Christ intended, it transforms our hearts, it transforms our souls. 
to see and feel and even hear things like we never have before. The man on trial in today's passage says, here is a truly amazing thing. Not that he should believe Jesus to be a prophet, but that the religious leaders should be so ignorant of Jesus and so disbelieving. The amazing thing here is not the faith. The amazing thing is the willing blindness. Jesus opened his eyes. This power was unique. To restore sight to one who had lost it was miraculous enough. But to give sight to one who had never had it before, that was unheard of. Theologian E.C. Hoskins stated that if a miracle proclaims the presence of a prophet, a miracle without parallel since the world began proclaims the presence of the Christ. So what is our spiritual blindness today? What causes us to miss our Savior in our world? What causes us to not see the hand of God in the world around us? Is the coronavirus that is running rampant through our world some type of punishment for our sins? In these uncertain times, I firmly believe that the coronavirus is not a punishment for our world's sins, but it is a reality, whether we like it or not. And God can still work mightily as stated in verse 3 of today's passage. Scripture also tells us in Matthew 5.45 that God sent the righteous and the unrighteous. As we search for meaning in the afflictions of the world, sometimes we look for quick fixes to help us understand. We need to be mindful that spiritual guides that are not grounded in God will lead us astray. Jesus said in Matthew 15.14, if one blind person guides another, both will fall in a pit. Some of us may live our lives under a cloud of fear that we can't see past. We've allowed anxiety to rule our actions, and not God. Putting every area of our life in God's control may be terrifying, but this is not the kind of life that God wants for us. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There are others of us that unfortunately are just indifferent to our faith, letting our days pass with no real spiritual searching, because we are too busy. Or we may not want to look too deeply at our faith, because it doesn't always turn out the way we would like it to. Yet even with our human failings, God is still shaping us and fashioning us into people he will use in what lies ahead. I think that pain and suffering is the price we pay for being alive. Being alive means living in a broken world and with the mighty power of Jesus' death on the cross. When we understand that, our questions will change. They'll change to what do we do with our suffering and pain. Our pain and suffering must become meaningful. It must not become pointless and empty suffering. So how can we turn all the painful experiences in our lives into personal growth within ourselves and within our relationship with God? The truth of the matter is we may never understand the why. We may never be able to control the forces that cause our suffering. But one thing is for sure. We can have a lot to say about what the suffering does to us. We can determine what sort of people we become because of it. Pain makes some people bitter and envious. It makes others sensitive and compassionate. It is the end result not the cause of the pain that makes some experience of pain meaningful and others empty and destructive. It's left up to us and our relationship with God. So looking back at our story in John 9, the man's connection to God began long before he ever met Jesus. He was born to play a very specific and powerful role in Jesus' ministry. 
His healing would shake the community around him, all who knew him and the local leaders. He wasn't healed because he was an exceptionally godly man. He wasn't even a believer at the time he was healed. He wasn't really healed because of anything he did or didn't do. He was healed so that God's works might be revealed in him. The story goes that a couple was staying at a small hotel in rural Georgia. The wife woke up, began packing, getting dressed and taking things to her car while her husband snoozed away. Get up, she said. I'm taking some things to the car and I swear, if you are not up when I get back, you will regret it. As she stepped out, the husband got up. Meanwhile, outside, the wife put the things in the car and went back to the room. Only one problem. She went to the wrong room. <laughs> she opened the unlocked door to see a man snoring away. I said get up, she shouted. Then at once, she realized she was in the wrong room and turned around, red as a beat, and slammed the door. The day stranger inside put the slip from his eyes and said, Man, that's what I call a wake-up service. <laughs> How many times have we been in the midst of a situation? A situation that we have invested all of our emotions and energy to and simply not seen it for what God intended it for? How many times have we ranted and raved at the injustice of a situation when all along, we were standing in the wrong room, yelling at the wrong man. How many times have we questioned the circumstances in our lives because we feel we deserve better? We deserve healthy children. We deserve the promotion. We deserve to be protected from the storm damage. We deserve to be protected from the illness. The truth of the matter is God doesn't keep us from going through trials in our lives. But he does promise to be with us throughout all of our lives. Deuteronomy 31.6 encourages us to be strong and bold. Have no fear or dread of them, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you, and he will not forsake you. God can use the trials in our lives to shape our lives in a powerful way. If we allow God to open our eyes to the world around us, to be transformed by seeing things as God truly intends for them to be seen, then we can begin to move past our preconceived notions, our attitudes of self-pity, and truly become the hands, the feet, and the eyes of Christ in the world in this very scary world that we find ourselves in. So today I want to ask you, what has happened in your life that has hurt you? Are you allowing God to use it to shape you into a person that looks more like Jesus? In the scripture passage read today, almost everybody fills the man born blind. Even his family backs away from him and his parents put their own safety above his brother. <laughs> Maybe we can understand an older couple being reluctant to sacrifice their home, their work, and their community for their son. But would we not expect them to celebrate with him, to be joyful over his healing? There is nothing of that in this text. The parents' fear overwhelms their joy and they abandon the son to the authorities. The community fails. The religious authorities fail. The family fails. The only trustworthy figure in this story are the man born blind and Jesus. The man tells the truth, and even in the face of threats, the abandonment of his community, the abandonment of his family, and the expulsion from the synagogue. He stands firm in his testimony. A testimony that would not have been possible before meeting with Jesus. 
This was a meeting he never sought out. He didn't ask to be healed. But this meeting would change his life in ways that gave him courage and strength to stand against it all. I was blind, but now I see. Again, and again, and again, the man witnesses to the saving grace that he experienced in Jesus Christ. It may be difficult to trust others, men, women, and even families, but we can always trust God. Although the Pharisees lay claim to dispensing grace, it is Jesus who transforms. It is Jesus who heals. It is Jesus who stood with the man in his isolation. He stands with us too. Sometimes when the sun is really bright, or when an artificial light is intense, we need to squint our eyes, or even shut them. The brightness seems dangerous to us, and it's an automatic reflex. Metaphorically, we see this human reaction unfolding in John 9. The light of the world shines bright, and the community, the Pharisees, and the man's family shut their eyes in self-defense. This is the intuitive thing to do, right? Wrong. In this text, everything is counterintuitive. The light of the world is in our midst. We need to not shut our eyes. In fact, the best thing to do is to open our eyes wide, like the blind man, so that we can stand with the strength and confidence of Christ as he did. We will not be blinded by the light. We will be saved. Throughout the Gospels, Christ proclaims, he who has ears, let him hear. In this passage, I think Christ is telling all present that day, and us today, he who has eyes, let them see. May we all be healed by Christ in a way that our eyes are open and see the world with new eyes. Christ's eyes. It's ironic that we find ourselves in the Lenten season today. A season of reflection, prayer, of giving up things that we have held, that have held us at a distance from God. Maybe we've used work. Maybe we've used school. Maybe we've used our children's sports. Maybe we've simply used sitting on the couch and watching TV. While these things are not inherently wrong on their own, they become a stumbling block to our faith when we use them to distance ourselves from God. Today we're forced to isolate ourselves from so many things that we wouldn't be choosing over spending time with God. With a new way of seeing the world, maybe this can be a Lenten journey that would not have been possible just a few weeks ago. A journey that can lead to rediscovery our, of our relationship with God. A time to pull away from our lives, to sit, to contemplate, to pray, and think of all the things that keep us from God in our normal lives and new ways that we can serve each other. So I challenge us to not look at this time as a time of punishment but an opportunity to spend more time in prayer, spend more time in God's Word, spend more time learning to see things that are truly important in our lives, to embody Lent in a way we have never had the opportunity to before. And now, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and for eternity. Amen. Amen.
thank you for worshiping with us from your home. It feels very odd, I'm sure, to be in your house worshiping and to be isolated from all your friends and family who would normally gather uh, for worship on the Lord's Day. It reminds me very much of a story that we find from John's Gospel after Jesus was raised and his disciples didn't understand it. The Gospel tells us that they were afraid. And so they went to a room and they locked the door. They were socially isolated. John tells us that Jesus walked into the room through that locked door. I hope that the gospel that you've heard today has been a means that Jesus has gotten through your door and has come to you. Three times in that passage, Jesus says to his disciples, peace be with you. In the Gospels, when Jesus says something three times, it's a way of saying continually, like dot, dot, dot. That means that he is still speaking peace to us right now, right now, this day. Jesus is Come into your room, into your home, and he is speaking peace, and he is breathing the Holy Spirit upon you. In the book of Philippians, we find Paul socially isolated, in prison, awaiting death. And he says, uh, be anxious for nothing, in all things, with prayer and supplication, make your request made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so even in an anxious time, the peace of God can keep us safe in our hearts and mind. I hope, as you have heard the gospel today, that even in the midst of a trying time and a dangerous time, that all that is happening in our world has awakened in you your need for God. We need a Savior. In John 3.16, Jesus says, God so loved the world, the world, that's all the people of the world, and that's the world collectively, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that tells us that Jesus loves us enough, that he has given his life, that he might be the savior of each of us and all of us. And so I'd like for us to have a time of prayer. And I ask all of us to open our hearts before God to receive the blessing that he offers us in this time. Let us pray. Holy God, through the gift of your spirit, we ask that you would break the illusion of our self-sufficiency and that you would open our spiritual eyes to our desperate need for you. We pray for this world that you love so much that you sent your son to die for it. Turn back this plague, we ask, O oh God. We intercede and ask that you would bring healings and solutions. We have learned that we are not capable of saving ourselves with all of our technology and with all of our medical advances, we still need you. Help us, O oh God. And we thank you, Father, that as we are alone for safety's sake, that we are not alone because you are with us. And so, Father, each and every one of us opens our hearts to you and we trust you. We reach out to you for salvation. Make of us a new heart. We give our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to thank again everyone who joined us. Um, the, the 
people of Red Hill United Methodist Church and Reverend Roger Whitaker, um, the people of First United Methodist Church of Mariana, and Dr. Nathan Atwood and Reverend Emily Hagen, um, the people of East Mount Zion Methodist and Spring Hill Methodist, and Reverend Josh Blunt. And also, all the way from Nixon, Missouri, the Reverend Brad Fox from North Point Church. Also, the people of this church, United Methodist Church of, uh, First United Methodist Church of Chipley, and our uh, wonderful uh, music leader, Moises Villegos. Um, next week, join us again, 9 o'clock. We're going to be coming live from First Methodist Church, Mariana. And then the week after that, for Palm Sunday, we're going to be coming from uh, First Methodist of Bonifay. So make plans to join us each week, and may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.